This meeting is being recorded. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, very good morning, uh, Dr. Aswan Yarmi, joining us from the United States. Uh, my name is Imran Sardar, and I am a research analyst at the Institute of Regional Studies. Uh, on behalf of the Institute, its ambassador, uh, President Ambassador Nadeem Riaz, and my colleague, I welcome all the participants uh, to this webinar. Today, we are going to discuss uh, post Al Zawahiri's uh, uh, assassination security situation within Afghanistan and beyond. So, uh, let me uh, throw some light on the background. Uh, first of all, it is uh, uh, beyond doubt that the United States, uh, uh, or the United States trusting the Taliban was difficult uh, since uh, US was extremely concerned about uh, the Taliban's relations with uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, so, this concern was uh, somehow addressed uh, in the Doha Agreement upon Taliban's guarantee of not harboring uh, terrorists on its soil and also not allowing. Uh, its territory to be used against any uh, country. And this is one of the core conditions, hardcore conditions that need to be fulfilled by the Taliban if they really want to get their foot on the ground. I mean, uh, if they really want to get their uh, recognition. So it's been one year without recognition, uh, but the Taliban continues uh, to dominate Afghan affairs. Uh, yes, there are internal and external challenges uh, uh, Taliban are confronting with, uh, but they somehow have managed their control over most of the uh, Afghanistan administrative affairs. So, however, uh, the recent uh, uh, episode of Amin al Zawahiri's assassination, uh, I think I think it's a big uh, upset for the Taliban. On one hand. Al Qaeda's presence uh, uh, in Afghanistan has questioned the credibility of the Doha uh, Agreement uh, signed between the Taliban and the United States back in uh, February 2020. Uh, on the other hand, its killing has furthered the complications for Taliban. Uh, uh, complication for the Taliban to deal with the militants uh, on their own. Apart, it has, it has also uh, censored the sensitize the security situation within Afghanistan and the border area. So what would be the future trajectory of the Taliban the US relations? Uh, what are the security implications for the region? And what kind of future counterterrorism mechanism is evolving in this region? To discuss, uh, we have uh, Dr. Asfan Yar Ali Mir with us, who is uh, uh, a senior expert in the Asia Center at the United States Institute of Peace. And he, uh, Dr. Asfand Yarmil, uh, received his doctorate in political science from uh, the University of Chicago. And he, is a, he has obtained his master's and bachelor's degree from Stanford University. He writes extensively on uh, Al Qaeda, counterterrorism issues, and um, Pak Afghan relations. So, uh, Dr. Asfand Yarmil, screen is yours. Great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Imran Sardar Sahib, for uh, having me. And thank you to the Institute of Regional Studies for uh, 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 for inviting me to this uh, seminar. I'm uh, delighted to be here, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation with, uh, uh, with colleagues and friends uh, on this call. Um, you know, Imran, I think you very helpfully framed uh, the, the challenge at hand in light of the discovery of Al-Qaeda chief Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, in Kabul uh, in, in August 2022. And I think it's also important to note that this uh, uh, that the discovery of the Al-Qaeda chief in Kabul uh, and his eventual cut killing comes at the one-year mark of the Taliban's rule uh, of, of Afghanistan. So in order to understand the implications uh, of, uh, you know, of this particular counterterrorism uh, strike, I think it's worth looking at the whole picture of the Taliban's political trajectory, uh, what their rule is looking like uh, at the, at the one-year mark, uh, and contextualize the counterterrorism 
uh, picture within that as opposed to looking at it in, in isolation. So I'm going to do that for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, you know, at the one year mark, the Taliban have very much consolidated territorial control across, um, across Afghanistan. Uh, and in the process, uh, at least put a lid on major sources of uh, armed resistance to their uh, nascent rule. Uh, and in order to forge a new political order uh, and an Afghan state, uh, the Taliban have, uh, in my view, repurposed uh, their organization, um, which was built for an insurgency, as well as some of the institutions of the, the former Afghan government uh, into, into a government of their own. However, it's important to note that the Taliban till today uh, remain without a constitution. Uh, there are also no real rules of business uh, at hand uh, uh, or in general, any kind of codified rules to govern the country. Afghanistan today is being run by, by decree of, uh, of, you know, of, of some senior select leaders, a process which is very opaque and, and not clear to uh, most uh, outsiders. Uh, the Taliban's focus uh, appears to be uh, ideological appeals to maintain the cohesion of their, their state apparatus. Uh, so so that's, a, that's a major priority for them. They're also repressing dissenting parts of the population uh, with the aim of preventing alternative political voices and actors from meaningfully coalescing uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, and this approach has, uh, has some advantages for the Taliban. It has allowed them to achieve uh, nominal uh, stability in the near term. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the Afghan population, this also means that this brings down uh, the levels of violence in the country quite substantially. So in many ways, Afghanistan today is uh, safer for Afghan civilians than it has been uh, in a long, long time. Uh, and that's because the actor which was engaged in most of the violence has transitioned from being an insurgency to a, to a state-like state actor. There's also a credible suggestion, at least in my read, that some Taliban leaders in Kabul want to focus on building uh, strong state institutions, ideally with foreign aid money. Uh, and this grouping, uh, or at least select leaders, may even be open to accommodating the concerns of the international community, including some of the, the counterterrorism concerns. So as a result, it is this specific grouping of people which spearheads the Taliban's uh, you know, public uh, counterterrorism assurances to the, to the international community. But at the same time, it's important to note that this constituency uh, is not the most important grouping uh, in, the, in the Taliban movement. And so is unable to sway Taliban decision-making on the more critical issues. And instead, uh, some of the indicators we have, ha we have at hand suggest that the more important subgroup within the Taliban, which has the decisive vote uh, on significant big ticket political issues uh, is actually not in Kapur, but based in Kandahar. And this is again, not the Kandahari Taliban, but a narrower group constituted by the Taliban Supreme Leader, uh, Mullah Hebatullah Khunzada uh, and his inner circle of, uh, of some clerics uh, that appear to exercise the veto uh, on some of these, these issues. Now in the last few months, uh, uh, Malvi uh, uh, Khunzada has defied the conventional view that he is a reclusive uh, southern uh, leader, or or even you know, or even mullah. As some some have uh, referred to him as pejoratively, you know, who only offers spiritual guidance but no strong views on on policy. Turns out, instead, he has a, a, a fairly uncompromising vision. Uh, which he's now asserting uh, over the movement. Uh, and that vision provides no indication that, uh, that the Supreme Leader wants to take the off-ramp towards sort of normalcy or, or moderation. So, so I think that's it's very uh, important to note. And there are uh, different uh, implications of that. Domestically, I think that means that 
uh, that the Taliban, um, you know, are are likely to enact harsh social policies. So we see uh, harsh policies against women, young girls. Uh, I think there are, you know, some ethnic and religious minorities uh, are also feeling the heat. Uh, and technically able and skilled Afghans uh, are continuing to leave the country. Uh, and for those who are outside, it doesn't appear that uh, that uh, the some of the, uh, the the olive branches that are being extended by the leadership in in Kabul are, are acceptable. So we have a shortfall of a workforce of sorts for the government. And and more significantly, I think Malvi Khunzada's um, position has implications for the Taliban's uh, foreign foreign relations. Uh, they are uh, unrelenting on some of the key core concerns of the of the international community, and as a result, the Taliban are struggling with their with their international relations. And this is despite the fact that initially, you know, there was some enthusiasm and even joy uh, uh, among some countries that the United States was leaving, and the Taliban had had replaced them. I put China and Russia in in that category, uh, you know, among major powers that were that were. Uh, you know, we're happy to see the United States leave, and then even regional countries, I think Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Iran, uh, which wanted the United States gone. So, uh, so it's you know the the Taliban started out on a on a strong footing, and yet no country has recognized them, uh, and the U.S. Uh, in particular and Western countries at large continue to reiterate that there is an international consensus on not recognizing the Taliban. Uh, in the in the near future, so that's that's one feature of their foreign relations. At the same time, it's true that uh, around ten countries have now opened um, a very serious dialogue with the Taliban and with varied modes of engagement. Some have even reopened their embassies in the country, uh, which breaks from the limited international diplomatic presence uh, in the Taliban's regime in the in the nineteen nineties. Uh, and select countries like Turkey, UAE, Qatar, they have even sought security sector contracts, um, uh, in particular for airport management in the country. Uh, the, you know, countries that have res resumed uh, diplomatic operations, but, but limited engagement include, include uh, India. But I think Taliban's most important relationship uh, is with, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has provided the Taliban with important political support you know, for for a long time, uh, and that relationship appears to be in a place of uh, a lot of stress. So, anti-Pakistan insurgents of the the TDP uh, have a safe haven, have political asylum in Afghanistan under the the Taliban, uh, from where they're continuing their attacks. Uh, and we saw this tension really peaking in April when Pakistan carried out airstrikes. Uh, in, in in eastern Afghanistan, and it appears that Pakistan is no closer to recognition today. Um, you know, despite the Taliban being in power for uh, for over a year now, I think the Chinese government is also important. Uh, they are engaging most certainly in in often invisible ways, uh, and they want uh, want to invest in the country's uh, uh, economy, mining sector in particular. Uh, but they're also limiting their uh, substantive uh, material help. And in general, the Chinese appear to be concerned about the trajectory of the country. Uh, the Russians uh, are also engaging, but they uh, repeatedly voice their concerns about the Taliban's lack of inclusion, as well as the terror threat in the country. And some of their worst concerns um, came true this past week when the, the Russian embassy was hit in a, in a suicide bombing. Uh, in 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 Kabul, so that's the state of, of foreign relations at the one year mark. I think it's also important to consider uh, the state of Afghanistan's economy, which has in many ways uh, nosedived, and this is uh, partly due to a precipitous drop in foreign aid uh, for for the country, which was previously sustaining the uh, the the U.S. backed um, uh, government. But now there are also sanctions against the Taliban. There's a liquidity crunch because of the frozen foreign exchange um, uh, of, of Afghanistan since the Taliban's takeover. And I'd say that the exclusion of women from the, the workforce 
uh, is also uh, having an impact on on the economy and contributing to its uh, its shrinkage. Uh, and the United States estimates a a continued substantial contraction of the country's GDP uh, going forward. So, so Afghanistan is going to be in this uh, very uh, low economic equilibrium um, for for the for the near term. I think economy is also where the Taliban have uh, uh, has something something positive to doubt, uh, and uh, specifically the uh, the Taliban have been able to uh, raise good amount of revenue, uh, and it's better than what was projected by many analysts at the time of their takeover. Um, so this seems to have happened due to uh, centralization of revenue collection at border crossings. Of course, improvement in security across the country has uh, has aided this kind of revenue collection, and we are also hearing about substantially reduced corruption um, in uh, in many facets of um, of economic activity. In particular, uh, um, uh, you know, there's lower corruption uh, when it comes to uh, uh, tax collection at border crossing. So, so that's important to note. But this this growth in revenue uh, or the Taliban doing better than what they were projected to do, I think, falls short of what is needed ultimately to stem the, the economic crisis in the country. Uh, international humanitarian aid um, has grown over the last several months uh, as the, the food crisis has deepened. Uh, but then due to the Taliban's decision to ban secondary girls education in the country, uh, and then ambiguous guarantees on ties with, with, with terrorist groups, and this concern is only reinforced by the discovery of Ayman al Zawahiri in, in Kabul. You know, some of the richer donor countries in the West uh, appear reluctant to provide uh, major support that the Taliban can, can repurpose or redirect uh, for some other uh, types of um, operations. Um, so it is in this backdrop that the terrorism, terrorism and counterterrorism situation is um, is now shaping up. And at the one year mark, uh, what we can say is that there are a range of terror threats that are festering in the country. And I organize a, a group, the, the terror landscape into uh, two uh, big categories. The first significant grouping is of uh, of groups that are aligned with or even friendly to the Taliban. So that includes uh, Al-Qaeda, that includes uh, the anti-Pakistan TTP, uh, that includes the anti-China Turkestan Islamic Party. Uh, there are uh, several uh, Chinese, uh, excuse me, Central Asian jihadist groups. There are some anti-India uh, focused groups as well. So that's the set of groups that is aligned with the Taliban. And then the second significant grouping uh, of armed groups, terrorist groups, um, uh, is of those that are opposed to the Taliban and are really challenging uh, the, the Taliban. Uh, and uh, the Islamic State of the Khorasan province, also known as ISIS-K, is at the, at the top of that list. Uh, of course, as we've discussed, the biggest scandal remains that um, Al-Qaeda core and its affiliate Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent are still in Afghanistan and seem to have the support of the Taliban at the highest levels. Uh, so Al-Qaeda chief uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri's presence in a compound which is being linked to the Taliban interior minister Siraj Khani uh, in some ways shows enduring support for Al-Qaeda. But it also indicates Al-Qaeda's own interest uh, in wanting to be based in, in Afghanistan. Now, remember, Al-Qaeda is, uh, uh, is a global network of sorts. It is present in, in, you know, in, in several different countries, in Africa, uh, in the Middle East, and of course, in, in South Asia. Uh, and yet, uh, the Al-Qaeda chief chose to be in, in Afghanistan. And that, to me, indicates that Al-Qaeda wants Afghanistan to still be the nerve center of its global affiliate network. It may not want to restore Taliban, uh, excuse me, Afghanistan to the kind of base it had pre 9 11, and, but, but it still sees uh, uh, value in having a political core 
uh, in, in this part of the world. But I think it's also important to note, and this is a key uh, um, you know, US concern, key Western concern, that uh, the group, Al-Qaeda specifically, seems to lack the capability for external plotting and attacks for now. Uh, and some analysts um, uh, even question uh, Al-Qaeda's intent to engage in transnational attacks. And perhaps this might be due to the restrictions imposed by the Taliban uh, uh, as a result of the, the, the U.S. Taliban uh, Doha Accord. So, uh, so, so yes, you know, Al-Qaeda is present, but the Taliban, um, it, or at least some of the interlocutors behind closed doors would insist that we never agree to expelling them. Uh, and we are following through on our commitment of, of restraining them. That would be their argument, but I think it is, um, uh, this argument is, is, is often very difficult uh, to believe. Uh, then on the other hand, there is uh, ISIS-K. It is the most important anti-Taliban grouping in Afghanistan. Uh, it is a Taliban rejectionist movement. They, they cannot stand the Taliban. They'd like to hurt them. They'd like to, uh, to, to topple them. And for now, this group appears to be pursuing a strategy of you know, outbidding violence. So what is outbidding violence? It's essentially a strategy of, um, of large scales, uh, in some ways, spectacular attacks against uh, noteworthy targets, uh, which in ISIS case case tend to be uh, you, you know, uh, the, the most vulnerable targets uh, in the country, like religious minorities. Um, and ISIS case seems to believe that such violence is likely to bring attention to its its actions and help it uh, generate both resources and and potential uh, recruits. Uh, the group seems to maintain units and cells in eastern Afghanistan, uh, as well as uh, you know, some some parts of northwestern Pakistan. You know, there's a there's a presence, reported presence in Kabul, perhaps also in northern Afghanistan, um, and and we are seeing that uh, ISIS K is uh, is also targeting. Taliban leaders, in addition to religious minorities, which is an approach that is consistent with this, this outbidding mode of, of violence. Uh, so overall, the counterterrorism picture um, in, in Afghanistan is, excuse me, is, is a very concerning one. You know, we can talk about the TTP in more detail if, if, there, is, uh, if there is interest. Uh, but given the trajectory the Taliban are uh, are on in terms of their relationships with various uh, terror actors, I think there are uh, significant concerns in, in Western capital. Uh, and any kind of engagement is going to be colored by, by the shadow of their uh, relationships, alliances, uh, alignments with some of these groups, as well as the concern that uh, that some capitals have that ISIS-K is continuing to thrive in the country, uh, and the attack on the Russian embassy uh, is going to uh, is going to keep a, a focus on that threat uh, going forward. Even countries that are that over the last few months uh, seemed to be closer to recognizing the Taliban, I think they're going to be asking uh, tougher questions of the Taliban on their on their counterterrorism guarantees and commitments. So I'll stop there and, and looking forward to the to the discussion. Ranjab, I I think you are muted. Imran, we can't hear you. Yes, it's it's unmuted. I have unmuted. I, I was muted by by the administrator. So uh, very good uh, uh, to listen from you. Uh, the situation uh, you have rightly pointed out. The situation in Afghanistan after the Azawahiri's assassination is uh, quite uh, disturbing, especially the trajectory between the um, uh, United States and the Taliban is is again on the confusing confusion or confusing front. So uh, 
Uh, my question, I want to just uh, move on to the DTP factor as well. Before that, I just uh, want to ask a question and, and uh, I have uh, two or three questions, then I'll open the floor for questions uh, for the participants. So it's been uh, one year to Taliban's rule um, and there is no regional uh, or bilateral security framework has been evolved between Afghanistan and any other regional country so what is the reason behind, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if I'm talking about the United States, uh, what United States is thinking about means, uh, are they looking for Taliban to respond, how did the Taliban respond to the, the security situ situation, particularly the terrorism, how the Taliban deals with the terrorism, this is what the, the United States is looking for, and then the regional country then will play out. Are they looking to United States, how it responds, or are they looking, uh, for instance, um, I, I just want to know that uh, uh, Taliban on their own have committed to deal with, with the ter terrorism phenomena. So this picture has been confused now uh, with Azawahiri's uh, assassination. So how long does the United States will wait for that uh, so, so what's your uh, uh, take on it? What United States is thinking about it? Sure. Uh, so, so the U.S. government seems to be uh, engaging bilaterally uh, with uh, with the Taliban. Um, so, there's a there's a special envoy uh, uh, who's, uh, who's who's held talks with the Taliban on a on a frequent basis, and uh, and if we look at, at at that engagement closely, it appears that there are three big issues uh, that the uh, that the administration is is focusing on. Uh, the first issue is, of course, counterterrorism, as you as you rightly note. Uh, we were we have heard about it uh, uh, for for many years now. In any kind of engagement with the Taliban, the United States government really centers that identifies. Uh, counterterrorism as the most important national security objective when it comes to uh, the Afghanistan, Pakistan region in general, and Afghanistan in particular. And so that focus remains. Uh, and we have heard about uh, the United States uh, reminding the Taliban of their um, the commitments in the, in the Doha Accord. And uh, there is uh, an effort underway to get the Taliban to be uh, to be more compliant with all that they have agreed uh, on the counterterrorism front in the in the Doha Accord, uh, but counterterrorism is not the only issue. And in some ways, uh, over the last few months, uh, based you know, given the picture that that uh, that uh, that I have painted here, um, uh, there are significant concerns about the Taliban's uh, lack of political inclusion. The fact that in many ways they are becoming this one party's uh, state uh, that there is no space for alternative political voices um, uh, and the U.S. government has really uh, prioritized that and has been having that conversation with the Taliban um, you know in, in Qatar or, or in Oslo wherever they've, they've engaged with the Taliban that uh, that perhaps you have to be more uh, more inclusive and on that count there appears to be more alignment between the the u s government and some regional actors. so uh, the the Russian government uh, seems to be pretty concerned about political inclusion as well. Uh, you know the United States and Iran do not talk, but um, but even the Iranian government seems to have uh, concerns about the Taliban's lack of political inclusion. There's some other uh, regional governments. Uh, I think it was, it was Uzbekistan doesn't voice it as much, but it's it's something that's at the back of their mind. Tajikistan certainly brings it up as well. So inclusion remains uh, a priority uh, for for the U.S. government. It seems to have pushed the Taliban on that. And then, uh, of course, the, there's a there's a there's a lot of concern about the human rights situation and about the fact that. Um, uh, secondary sc uh, school age girls uh, are unable to go to school. There, there, there are there is at least a uh, an announced restriction. Though we heard that schools in some provinces might be open, but in general, the, the policy of the Taliban government is to not allow uh, uh, girls to go to school, and I think that is a big concern. And again, on that 
front, um, I see um, I see some division. I think it's uh, the the United States government really centers that um, uh, as an as an as a priority issue. The region, however, uh, not so much. I think it is uh, less of a priority for some regional governments compared to to the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another, uh, I think there is a hand raised by the president of the Institute of Regional Studies. So the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a very fascinating talk. Um, the question which I have is like, you know, if you look at the year of uh, Taliban in Afghanistan, they have slowly started going back on the various promises which they have made uh, uh, at Doha. Now, do you think that uh, this particular trend, which is uh, to me a bit apparent, do you think it is a sign that the moderates are being sidelined and the hardliners are uh, coming to the forefront of the Taliban? Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, I, I agree with you that, uh, that I think uh, uh, that in, in some ways the Taliban are going back on the commitments uh, that they were making before coming into power as part of the Doha Accord, as well as in their engagement with various uh, uh, regional uh, government. Uh, they were uh, uh, repeatedly insisting that they will not allow Afghanistan to once again become a uh, a haven for international terrorists, or they will not allow Afghanistan to be used uh, by terror groups against other countries. And of course, uh, even on rights issues, they were making uh, some, some broad reaching commitments and uh, they're not following through. Uh, and, and one explanation of that is, is the one that you're providing here, uh, uh, Ambassador, about Taliban moderates losing out to hardliners. But as I, I look at the Taliban's internal politics, I don't organize it in terms of hardliners versus moderates. And instead, the, the framework that, uh, uh, that I uh, refer to is that the Taliban are divided among people who want to focus on state building, uh, who would like to see stronger state institutions uh, in Afghanistan, versus people who have more uh, jihadist um, worldviews, uh, who have visions of uh, more expansionist uh, jihadist activity, be it in the region or beyond. And it seems like it's this camp of jihadists, uh, which is uh, starting to, um, uh, to prevail over those who are uh, more interested in state building. Uh, and it is this camp which is constantly reminding the state builders that, look, we, um, uh, we lost so many people in this, in this war. We, uh, we sacrificed so much. We have all these martyrs. You know, the Taliban supreme leader, Mullah Hebatullah Kundada, for example, in his, even in his public speeches, he's reminded the audience that his own son was a, uh, was a, you know, was a suicide bomber. And, uh, and so, uh, how is it possible that they can they can make all these concessions to the international community, sort of fulfill their demands, and compromise uh, uh, for some of the positions that uh, that all these people have uh, laid down their lives for? So, so I think there is this internal political tension between uh, two groupings and constituencies which have very different end states. Uh, and the, the consequence of that for the international community is that some of the commitments that the, that the Taliban leadership made say in Doha or in other West, uh, well, other capitals, I think they're not being followed through on. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open for the questions. Uh, you can post your question in the chat box or uh, you can use the hand raise, hand raise option. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Veer, uh, I just wanted to ask that uh, uh, after Al Zawahiri's assassination, uh, TTP leader Umar uh, Khalid Khorasani was also killed in Afghanistan. And we can see it has not deterred the TTP. Uh, it continues killing and taking hostages, uh, the security personnel in, uh, in, uh, in Deir or Sawat area. So, do you think that uh, the peace talks? Uh, between TTP and Pakistan, uh, lower 
uh, or you think the ne negotiation might end up at some some agreement i think this is uh, this is a very uh, important uh, issue uh, uh, the taliban's relationship with uh, with the pakistani taliban ttp uh, you know, in uh, you know, uh, I think in the international press it doesn't get as much attention. But in my view, it really speaks to uh, the Taliban's um, interest in still maintaining relationships with some of these groups uh, that they have made commitments uh, on. And it's you know, in, in it is a clear sign that the Taliban are not meeting their uh, their counterterrorism obligations. Uh, but if you talk to Taliban interlocutors, they will say that, look, we are trying our best to restrain them. Uh, and, and we brokered this, uh, this ceasefire. Uh, and, and now it is Pakistan's turn to, to offer concessions to the TDP and uh, bring this war, war to an end. Uh, and then the TDP is making some really steep demands uh, and, and claims uh, they want um the the merger of the fata region to be uh, uh, to be reversed they also want substantial reduction in the levels of uh, pakistani security forces and if pakistan was to follow through on those uh, on those demands we meet those demands of the ttp uh, that that in effect would hand over the the fata region uh, to the ttp and the ttp would will emerge as a major political player uh, in that part of, of Pakistan. So the, the discussion dialogue appears to be at an, at an impasse. I think the only way uh, this dialogue can move in a direction which might be more palatable to Pakistan is if the Taliban uh, were to put more pressure on the TDP and get it to back off from some of, it, uh, some of its more strident claims um, get it to um, uh, to uh, to at least uh, drop its demand of the Fata merger reversal or uh, the reduction of Pakistani security forces. That seems to be the only way forward. Um, if the if these dialogue uh, if these talks are to to succeed, excuse me. Um, and I am not seeing uh, any meaningful signs uh, that the Taliban are interested in putting that kind of pressure. Uh, on the TP. If anything, Taliban Pakistan relations uh, appear to be inflamed after the Zawahiri uh, strike. Uh, the Taliban's leadership uh, is, uh, is finger pointing at Pakistan for uh, allowing its uh, airspace to be used by, uh, by the US government for drone surveillance, uh, as well as the, the strike against Ayman Zawahiri. And we've heard such threats. Uh, uh, or such statements from uh, the Taliban Supreme Leader uh, recently, as well as uh, the Taliban uh, Defense Minister. So, so I think uh, the, the Taliban-Pakistan relationship is not in a good place. Uh, and that means that the Taliban have even less incentive to pressure the TDP. And perhaps that's one reason why we're seeing this escalation in, in violence. And so that leaves Pakistan in a very tight spot. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't envy Pakistani policymakers at this point. Uh, they don't have many great options. Uh, and the TDP's threat is very real. It has thousands of fighters. Um, and we also hear reports of some Afghan Taliban fighters wanting to join or align with the, with the TDP. So this threat can, uh, can easily uh, grow uh, going, going forward as well. So I think in the given situation, <clears throat> you know, and the, India is also approaching the Taliban. Uh, related to that, I just wanted to ask a question that Taliban relation uh, with the Taliban is also streamlining. Streamlining. So do you think the India can play uh, uh, a role in bringing United States closer to the Taliban? Uh, I, I am skeptical that uh, uh, India can uh, uh, India is going to be uh, a major player in, in in Afghanistan going forward. I think India has some of its own concerns. Uh, they have uh, terrible memories of the Taliban's rule uh, the first time they were in power, 
there were, um, you know, I, if you talk to Indian policymakers, they will remind you of the hijacking of their airplane, uh, IC-814, which landed in Kandahar. And uh, even though the, the, the Taliban defense ministers tried to assure uh, uh, Indians that, uh, that Mullah Omar tried to resolve that situation in a way that would save Indian lives, I think Indian concerns remain. And so um, the main reason for Indian engagement, in my view, uh, is to uh, is to make sure that uh, some of these anti-India uh, groups, um, you know, do not get a lot of space in in Afghanistan. And to that extent, they are getting some guarantees, much like the rest of the world is, much like Pakistan got some guarantees, much like the United States did. Of course, it's an open question if those guarantees actually uh, amount uh, too much. Uh, India for now is not offering much in terms of actual material help, so that will uh, limit their influence and sway over um, over over the Taliban. Uh, and finally, I think the United States would coordinate with the Indians um, uh, in in various ways, but uh, its own set of priorities with the Taliban are uh, are so challenged uh, that uh, I don't think it's going to defer to the Indians or anyone else uh, at this point in time. I think the, the U.S. is going to really lean on its own bilateral engagement, what it hears from the Taliban on that channel uh, to determine how to proceed uh, uh, further. Thank you. I have an, another question in the chat panel. Uh, this question is from uh, Faraz Nakvi. He's, uh, Assistant Research Officer at this institute. So he's asking, you can also read from the chat panel that apart from the Al-Qaeda and ISKP, but the Mun is also present, which is uh, a major factor in Iranian power in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. What impact do they have with this Taliban? I think, you know, my visibility into uh... Uh, to the Iranian calculus on the Taliban uh, is uh, is not great, uh, uh, but to the extent I can tell, it appears that the Iranian government is also uh, ambivalent uh, on the Taliban. Uh, they are engaging with the Taliban. Uh, they have retained their diplomatic presence in the country. I think they're concerned about uh, the security of uh, of the Shia population at large and the Hazara. Uh, population in particular, and so they engaged the the Taliban uh, on on that count um, pretty uh, regularly. Uh, the Taliban and Iran also uh, have um, seem to have spoken, negotiated about some of their border disputes, about distribution of water resources. Iran and and Taliban have well, Iran and Afghanistan traditionally have had uh, problems uh, over. Uh, over waterways that uh, traverse the, the Iran-Afghanistan border. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the Iranian government is also nervous about the trajectory of ISIS-K um, in the country. Um, and, um, and they are also worried about the, the influx of Afghan refugees uh, into, into Iran. Uh, and they seem to realize that until there is stability in, in Afghanistan, there's going to be uh, a movement of people in the direction of Iran, which would, which would put a lot of stress on some of their uh, you know, eastern, uh, northeastern regions. So, uh, so I think much like the rest of the region, Iran is pursuing this, uh, this sort of dual track policy of exerting some pressure on the Taliban on the one hand, while at the same time trying to engage them. And on the specific issue of some of these um, these paramilitaries uh, like Fatimi Yun, you know, Fatimi Yun has been around for a long time. Uh, they've, they've fought in Syria as well. Uh, but now that the conflict in, in Syria has, um, uh, has come down a notch, at least in terms of its intensity, I think um, uh, Iran's desire to, to recruit uh, from Afghanistan is, is probably lower. Uh, and I don't see any significant signs that uh, Iran is trying to increase the recruitment of Afghan fighters. Um, uh, we have heard that maybe uh, they might be recruiting from some people 
um, uh, who have moved into the country, some Afghans who moved into the country and want to send them in the direction of, of Yemen, but those reports appear to be tentative for now. Uh, I have another question from uh, Noreen Akhtar. Uh, she's asking that uh, uh, his question, her question is related to Pakistan's approach. Uh, what do you think how Pakistan should move forward to have smooth bilateral relations with Kabul? Sure. I think this is uh, this is an important question that I hope uh, Pakistani decision makers and uh, policy makers are constantly uh, thinking about. Look, as I uh, as I see uh, Pakistan Taliban relations since the Taliban's takeover, Pakistan has uh, tried uh, uh, two different approaches. Uh, in you know initially, Pakistan was very forward leaning. Uh, you know, Pakistan, uh, you know, right after the Taliban's takeover, went to the international community and started saying uh, that let bygones be bygones, let's turn a page. They've uh, uh, they've risen to power in in Afghanistan, and let's let's try to uh, create space for them, diplomatic space for them. Uh, let's start working towards recognition, uh, and you know, and Pakistan was. Um, uh, was uh, was very aggressive in in that effort and tried to convince the Chinese. You know, even uh, pleaded with some other regional powers, of course, with the United States, uh, which was deeply upset at the outcome uh, of uh, uh, of you know of the war of its twenty year war in in Afghanistan. Uh, so Pakistan was forward leaning and Pakistan was trying to be helpful. Uh, and in that time period, what we saw was that the Taliban. Uh, created actively created more space for the TTP. Uh, we also saw uh, some some tensions over over the Durand line. Then, at, you know, at the start of that year, I think Pakistan, uh, you know, disappointed by the Taliban's policy choices uh, as well as some some international pushback and pressure, uh, uh, started to. Um, uh, to tamp down some of its uh, um, its uh, diplomatic um, uh, you know, its its diplomatic effort to rehab the Taliban, uh, and in that time period, we see that violence by the TTP started going up pretty substantially, and then it peaked uh, in the month of March and April, and at that time, Pakistani policymakers seem to have shifted gears altogether. Uh, and uh, and they went for a, the this this kinetic military option, um, and carried out airstrikes, and that really shook the Taliban. In in my read, I think initially there was some. Um, um, uh, uh, I think the the Taliban behaved in a way which suggested that they might retaliate, but. On the other hand, uh, we we find out that the Taliban felt some 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 serious pressure of uh, of Pakistan's actions, and it felt the heat. Uh, and in response, the Taliban interior minister Siraj Khani rushed to the TTP and arranged a ceasefire between Pakistan and the TTP. So the Taliban responded to Pakistani pressure. Now, for the last few months, we see Pakistan again shifting gears and trying to engage more, be you know, be more forward leaning. Uh, and in that uh, time period, we see the discovery of um, uh, of Ayman Zawahiri in Kabul, as well as significant um, problems in Pakistan TTP talks. So, at the one year mark, Pakistan has tried two different uh, approaches, and in my read. Uh, uh, Pakistan seems to have had a little bit more success in uh, in securing some of its uh, core interests um, by more coercive means, by applying some pressure. That's when Pakistan has seen most movement on issues that it is concerned about. Um, so, so I think you know that's that's the record at hand uh, for policymakers to to consider, um, and and I hope that they will they will keep this uh, sort of empirical reality in mind as they try to craft a, a path forward. Very good. Uh, this is the Pakistani side. Uh, you have uh, rightly pointed out that uh, Pakistani demands from the Afghanistan. You know, it has been very clear for the, uh, for, uh, for everyone that uh, 
Pakistan's demands from Afghan Tal Taliban are pretty clear because uh, uh, Pakistan wants the Taliban should completely understand Pakistan security uh, sensitive sens sensitivities attached with Pakistan border and also should not support any group or any country that working against Pakistan. So, or uh, against military. So in your opinion, what Taliban uh, believes that Pakistan is not doing enough that the Afghan Taliban has been demanding for the last one year? It's, it's very difficult to say if the Taliban's uh, you know, current policy position um, is results from something Pakistan has done over the last uh, year or so. Um, you, you could say that maybe the Taliban want Pakistan to rec uh, recognize their, their government uh, and and in return, the Taliban may uh, may move uh, on some of these other issues. But we have not heard that demand, at least not publicly. And there are no other indications that the Taliban uh, have, uh, are promising to to sort of solve the DP problem or to move on on the status of the Durand line. Um, we have not heard that from the Taliban at this point. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that uh, Pakistan is, um, or relations with Pakistan uh, are, a, uh, are one of the main issues in Afghan domestic uh, politics. Um, you know, Pakistan is, uh, is, is deeply disliked in, 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 in Afghanistan and there is a special premium on, on being hostile, domestic political premium uh, on being hostile towards Pakistan. And this was the case with the former Republic. And this is also the case uh, with, with the Taliban. So, so in some ways, um, the Taliban's current position uh, towards Pakistan can be a function of their own sort of domestic uh, politics, as well as the, 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 it may reflect the opinion within the Taliban movement, which is not favorable towards, uh, towards Pakistan. So uh, it's been an hour. Uh, I just move on to one last question about the sure. counterterrorism mechanism. So, uh, what do you think? What kind of a counterterrorism mechanism is in is involving in this region? It is, you know, this is United States, Pakistan, and Taliban nexus on counterterrorism, or something else else is. Sure. I, so I think the mechanism that. Uh, uh, that uh, even the United States would have preferred, I think, um, and other regional powers wanted to uh, wanted to see unfold was uh, was one where the Taliban would sort of take the lead in uh, in uh, uh, in restraining some of these terror threats and restricting them, uh, and ideally in in cracking down against uh, them. Um, so the Doha Accord was an effort in that direction. I think some of the other bilateral engagement on counterterrorism we saw between uh, the Taliban and other regional countries, and, and that includes Pakistan. Um, there was this effort to have this kind of a, a mechanism, but that mechanism appears to be, uh, uh, you know, appears to be failing at this point. I think uh, the international community is having a hard time trusting the Taliban when it comes to uh, it's counterterrorism assurances. So then we're left with this other option that, you know, that both Pakistan and the United States have pursued, which is of unilateral military activity uh, to go after terror threats uh, that are uh, emanating from, from Afghanistan. Uh, and the United States certainly has more technology, more military wherewithal, so it is able to undertake precision strikes to neutralize the threats that it is most concerned about. Pakistan doesn't have that kind of capability, and instead, Pakistan has undertaken these airstrikes, uh, whose, uh, uh, which, which end up causing a lot of damage uh, on the ground. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I think that it is the second uh, approach of unilateral military activity, um, which would uh, remain uh, uh, a, a, you know, the, the, the tool that, that most of these countries sort of go to uh, in case they start uh, seeing 
major threats emerge um, in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, and you know and for that reason, I think we can see more violence uh, in in the coming months and years. Thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to give floor to uh, Ambassador Shah Jamasa, who has just joined us. He wanted to ask the questions. So floor is, is yours, uh, Ambassador Shah Jamasa. Thank you very much, Aswindya. It was nice listening to you, and I concur with your observation that looking at the last year, one could conclude that Taliban were ruling not by codification of rules, but by through decree. And those decrees are having enormous impact and would change the future direction that the country is going to take because major institutions have been closed like Human Rights Commission in Afghanistan. In addition, three other institutions have been closed there have been additional restrictions which have been imposed on movement of women. They even for medical treatment, they have to be a complete, they can't go beyond 70 miles area. So all these things, these are retrogressive things which are happening. And these are, instead of having an inclusive government or the promises which were earlier made, they are going in the reverse direction. Recently, all the human rights organizations and the, all the reporters have concluded that the human rights situation is degrading and the 90% population is going to face hunger and is going to live below the poverty line. So what future do you see? Do you think if all these assurances which have been given would fail, what option will the UN have to help the people in Afghanistan? This is a leading question, but I want to just pick your brains. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for that question, Ambassador. Um, I, again, I think the set of options available to the international community are, are not great. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the international community has tried engaging the Taliban. Uh, they've, of course, tried coercion in the past, um, and, and the outcomes are, are not great. And I think the consensus that I'm seeing emerge, at least in Western capitals, is um, is to establish channels of providing humanitarian support uh, directly uh, to the population to the extent they can work around the Taliban to reach the Afghan population. Um, I think that that seems to be the main line of effort, and we may see more effort in that direction uh, going going forward. Uh, but that would be inadequate. I think uh, that is unlikely to work. So what we might really need is a new regional uh, concert or a concert of regional countries and like-minded countries that are uh, in you know vested in the situation in Afghanistan to sort of come together. Uh, and try to broker a new pact uh, on what they expect uh, of the Taliban uh, and then try to push them on, on some, of those, um, uh, some of those expectations. Uh, but in general, you know, I agree with you, it's, 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 a, it's a very challenging situation. I think no one wants to get more involved in the country either. You know, not, none of the major powers seem to be interested uh, in in getting more involved, they have uh, their own fires to put out. Um, so so I think we are going to be on this on this on this path for for a for a period of time. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Sharjamal sir. Uh, it's over from your side. Yes, from my side it's over. It is just that the World Bank had started four projects which they stopped, but then with the exception of the project in education, 132 million have been withheld while other money is coming. But in case if they continue this, all that will also stop. How does he see that? Uh, again, I, I agree. I think I think if the, if the Taliban do not, uh, do not improve and cannot meet the expectations of some of these important Western capitals, uh, whatever little aid that has 
uh, that has come their way, they're, they're likely to even lose that. So, so I, you know, I don't think the international community is going to ease up uh, in provision of aid and help to the Taliban uh, uh, un unless they see meaningful uh, improvements in, in Taliban behavior. Thank you. So I, I think that Afghanistan is a forgotten chapter now in the, in the West and in particular the, for the United States. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. I, I think I think the, the amb Ambassador Durrani uh, has, has a question. I'm seeing his, his, his raise his hand. Uh, Ambassador Durrani, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Asan, they are uh, very illuminating. Uh, uh, discourse you have given us. Uh, I wondered uh, there are certain contradictions in the American attitude while dealing with Afghanistan. And uh, I list a few of them. For instance, it was the United States which uh, negotiated with the Taliban, supposedly terrorists under 1267 committee. And there are still 135 Taliban who figure uh, who's, uh, who are to be taken to account for, uh, so they are there, including uh, many of the cabinet ministers uh, in, in the Taliban cabinet. Second is that uh, they want to have negotiations with the Taliban. They agreed, they shook hands in, at Doha and then uh, which uh, in a way gave the impression, yes, there was some positive movement going on between Taliban and uh, the United States. But now what we see is that US withdrew its troops, but at the same time it's uh, uh, slapped uh, sanctions, uh, like uh, no business with the banks. The result is that uh, economically Afghanistan has been squeezed. It is just not the Taliban. They are ruling the country, it's a reality, but it is actually the, the 39 million Afghans who are suffering. And almost 90% of the country is suffering from abject poverty. That is another contradiction. Then in the, when you see immediate neighborhood of Afghanistan, so United States is isolated except for Pakistan, which uh, gives the uh, United States uh, a transit. Uh, no question from Iran or Central Asian states or China. So here we are living in a situation and uh, in a neighborhood which, uh, 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 in which uh, the tensions uh, would be a natural corollary and uh, then we should not expect peace uh, coming to uh, either Afghanistan or to the region anytime soon. So here I wanted to pick up your brains because uh, this dichotomy has to be addressed. US's dichotomy towards Afghanistan are right now to the ruling, uh, ruling clique which is in Kabul ruling right now. So the, I wanted the, how uh, you think and then how, what is the thinking uh, there in the United States, especially amongst the think tank circles? I thank you. Sure. Uh, Ambassador Durrani, uh, you know, I think uh, you, uh, you know, point out some, in your words, some important contradictions uh, in, in the U.S. approach and uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, Steve Cole, uh, the, the famous author uh, of, uh, of, of books on, uh, on Afghanistan and Pakistan. And recently he had a new essay in, uh, 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 in the New Yorker in which he wrote that, uh, you know, today's Afghanistan is a, is a foreign policy problem from, uh, from hell. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foreign policy nightmare uh, even for uh, the administration, given that they have to balance these competing concerns about uh, terrorism, human rights, political inclusion. So it's it's a very difficult problem. And of course, the fact that the Afghan population is at uh, risk today, you know, so many people uh, are, are, under, uh, are under poverty and, and 
the U.S. sanctions regime, or, or lack of engagement, is certainly contributing to to that. Uh, but I I think um, the consensus view here is that um, these concerns about terrorism and human rights are far too great, uh, and that if the Taliban were to move meaningfully on some of these uh, these concerns, you know perhaps there can be a different sort of relationship between the United States and a Taliban-led Afghanistan. But if that doesn't happen, uh, you know, there's just no need for uh, for more more uh, engagement, direct engagement. Then I think about it from the Taliban's perspective that yes, the United States is a big player, was present in, in Afghanistan over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, but in this this in this phase when the United States has left Afghanistan, they could have completely cut out the Americans and just uh, you know work with with major powers like China, Russia, even Pakistan, perhaps bring in Iran, Uzbekistan. I mean, there's a there's a critical mass of countries that were uh, that were actually enthusiastic about sort of working with with the Taliban, wanted to help them stabilize uh, their regime. Uh, but fact is that it's not, you know, that the Taliban have failed to to satisfy even even them, uh, that they are not able to come up to measure up to the expectations of these other major powers, uh, and minimize uh, in you know in turn the the role of the the United States government in in Afghanistan. So this continuing dependence of uh, of Afghanistan and the Taliban. On, on the Americans is uh, is it is not just a, a function of current U.S. policy, but it's also a failure of the Taliban to rally uh, some of these other countries uh, and uh, and uh, and get them to adopt more uh, uh, more favorable uh, policies. Um, so, given that, I I think. Um, uh, I think the Taliban's sort of best hope and chance is to convince some of these other major powers, and that includes Pakistan, on the recognition question, on sort of more economic help and aid, uh, and really try to cut out uh, the, uh, the the United States government from uh, uh, from the process. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asfandi Armeer. It was really nice to hear from you. It was really a comprehensive presentation. And uh, you know what, uh, I can conclude that um, uh, we have tried the regional approach that was uh, not working. And uh, the West and particularly the United States, uh, there is no hope in the, in the near future for any recognition of some formal, uh, perhaps there are some channels in which the working relationships uh, are just streamlining. So the only thing that I can uh, see uh, that the bilateral uh, channel is there and every country is approaching Taliban on their own. So this is the, the situation uh, right now, what I can uh, just observe from the whole discussion. So it was really nice. And uh, uh, you know the discussion on this subject was crucial for understanding uh, the dynamics of uh, regional uh, dynamics and the situation going on in Afghanistan. So uh, the Institute of Regional Studies has conducted very uh, several uh, events on it. And uh, uh, in the coming uh, days, uh, we are also organizing uh, events on Afghanistan. And, uh, uh, Probably uh, we will invite you in person since you are coming to Pakistan uh, next week. So uh, looking forward to see you. And uh, thank you very much. Have a very nice weekend. And thank you all the participants, Ambassador Asif Durani Saab, Shah Jamal Saab, and President Ayras, and my colleagues, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Allah Hafiz. Allah.